Hey, good day. It's welcome back to uh, Lebanon In Depth. Uh, it's my pleasure today to have our fire chief, Chris Christopoulos, here. And um, we thought, you know, it's, as spring approaches, I mean, the activity level um, is going on. And I, I think it's a great time to talk about what the fire department does. Um, as we get more active out there, we know that the activity goes up, things happen. Uh, and our fire department does so many different things from, uh, you know, actually the firefighting to the EMT services to many other services. So welcome, Chris. Great. I'm glad to be here, Greg. Great. So, uh, as I've been you. asking everybody that comes here, I, I like to, part of our engaging the community is to kind of let the community know who we are. I mean, you're well known in the community, but it's always good, I think, because the community is a very diverse community. Kind of let us know a little bit about your background. I mean, where, you know, what, where's your background? How did you get into the, into the profession of a firefighting? Well, it's kind of a, it's a pretty uh, big background, I guess, at this point. I'm, I'm entering my 31st year in the fire service. Which, oh, congratulations. Uh, which that's is, uh, I, I never, I, and I'm only 35 years old, so that's pretty good. That's pretty good. <laughs> that's, that's pretty good. <laughs> no, uh, long and short of it is uh, my father was a state trooper in Connecticut um, uh, for, for all of his life and uh, unfortunately died at a very young age of 57. Um, and having been brought up around public safety and public service, it was uh, it was interesting. But I didn't feel like I wanted to be a police officer. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And uh, I, in 1981, I got involved with a volunteer department in my community, my hometown of Wallingford, Connecticut. Oh, I'm a flatlander, as I've uh, been affectionately uh -huh. called. Uh -huh. And um, I really kind of got the bug. It was it was interesting because I went to high school to be to learn plumbing and heating. Oh wow! <laughs> and ended up getting the bug uh -huh. and. Uh, I went on to paramedic school. Um, I was hired in uh, West Haven, Connecticut, full time as a firefighter in the Senate District. It's a, a small community, but three different fire departments, which uh -huh, is a, uh -huh. probably a story for a whole other day. Yeah, and um, I really liked it. It just yeah. it, it kind of caught on from there. I stayed uh -huh. in West Haven for a number of years, and then decided that maybe management was a, a, a new way to go in in the, in the fire service. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, just about 13 years ago, I took a, a fire chief's job in, uh, in southern New Hampshire, a little town okay. called Ringe, New Hampshire. Okay. Uh, college town, Franklin Pierce College. Uh -huh. I think they're college, university, I can't yeah, remember what they're yeah. called now. Mm -hmm. And um, my, my job there was I was the fire chief, building inspector, health officer. It was kind of the small town, yeah. one, five, Jack of one all size trades, fits all. These all. Things. And um, this past Saturday, I celebrated my 10th anniversary with the city of Lebanon. And oh, good. Congratulations. Uh, I've been uh, very proud to be here and uh, in, in, uh, in planting my roots. My, my wife yeah. is from the area. Oh, our our stepkids are from the area. Uh -huh. And uh, we live in West Lebanon and uh, with two dogs, two kids at home, one out of the house, which is, uh, um, keeps us pretty yeah. busy. Well, it does. It's a lovely place to live here. I I, 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 we're kind of neighbors because we, we live in the same neighborhood. It's a lovely neighborhood up in West Leb. There's so many lovely neighborhoods in, in, West, in Lebanon and West Lebanon, and, and, and I enjoy our neighborhood. I know, we, I know you, you and your wife go and enjoy the neighborhood walking around, and, uh, and I enjoy with my I have three dogs, in, uh, we're both dog people. And uh, so that's kind of cool. It's, it's cool to live in such a great place. Uh, now, to, I think people have some assumptions about what a fire chief is. But I don't know if they're all correct. And, and what is a fire chief exactly? Well, it uh, it uh, it kind of a pretty complicated story or, or, or description. It's uh, we we uh, the fire service has evolved over the last two hundred plus years to to be that kind of one stop shop when when somebody has a problem they don't know what to do they call a fire department. Um, so. My my day to day job is to administer the the fire department, um, manage the budget and and the, the the dollars and cents of the fire service in a in a in a very fiscally conservative manner. That's that's one of the things I pride myself on probably the most mm -hmm. um, with my position. And the way that I usually describe it is that it's my job to give the troops the tools. It's their job to go out and do the job. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. and as long as I give them the tools, um, they do the job very well. We're mm -hmm. very fortunate to have a, a, a great, great, great young group of firefighters mm -hmm. and, uh, and emergency medical technicians in, yeah. uh, within, within the city. Someone new to the community. I'm very impressed with the firefighting force. Uh, it seems like a splendid group of people. They're really dedicated, really... It seems it seems young. They do seem young to me. Uh, for the uh, some not, but most seem kind of young. Well, it's interesting that at the that in the ten years that I've been with the city, the the dynamics of the fire department have changed significantly. In the in the in the we're 
we, we now look at the organization and that about 60% of the 28 or so full-time people we have have probably five years or less in the fire service, which mm -hmm. is a, a really young organization, but it's, um, mm -hmm. I, I think the beauty of it for me is that it's, it's very easy to implement change when you have a group of people mm -hmm. that want to learn and, and want to do. And, and yeah. um, mm -hmm. so it makes my job really easy yeah. um, in, in that respect. But They're full of energy, that's for sure. But, you know, as a fire chief, I'm responsible under mm -hmm. under New Hampshire state law to uh, to manage um, the the overall impact and, and application of the state fire code, as well as uh, we have a local fire code, which is a little bit different than the state code. It's more up to date. Mm -hmm. um, it gives us some better tools to work with mm -hmm. builders and, and property owners. Um, in yeah. in building um, we manage an ambulance service 24 hours a day seven days a week so all of our firefighters are cross trained to provide emergency medical so services. they're both qualified as firefighters but they're also qualified as EMT EMT and paramedic and we paramedic. have okay I think right now we're at about 13 paramedics and I have two people in school right now so it's a uh, it's really kind of a neat you know mix um, so it, it allows us to utilize some of the time that we're not, and we don't have a lot of fires because we have good fire prevention codes and, and yeah. good public education. Um, so it allows us to utilize those people for other things and bring in about six, $700,000 worth of revenue to, to help offset the cost of running a fire department. Um, we're, so we're responsible for emergency medical services for f not only the city, but we're under a contract for Enfield part-time and Plainfield right. and Meriden, um, mm -hmm. mostly full-time. Um, the other hat that I wear is a, is a local emergency management director, mm -hmm. which is uh, which we found during uh, mm -hmm. the tropical storm Irene and, and yeah. some of the snow events that we have and power mm -hmm. outages that mm -hmm. uh, it could be a challenge. And some of the subjects we're going to be, I know we're, we're having internal discussions with the council, city council at this point. Um, they'll go through that discussion. I, we had a work session. We'll probably have another work session. And then at some point there'll be a decision by the councils to bring it out and whether to enter into the formal uh, public hearing process. We really want commu you know, community engagement, like members of the community to be aware of this. And the types of subjects that we'll see in this, what we've seen in the conversations so far, just general, generically, and the type of conversations probably will continue in terms of subject matter, would be what kind of subjects? Um, well, as, as the majority of the discussion at last night's work session was you know, centered around residential fire sprinklers and what the city can or can't do. Um, I think, you know, what we're, what, what, you know, as an advocate for fire safety and, and fire sprinklers, I think it's important for us to still um, maintain that requirement um, to some degree within the city and maybe take a different approach towards um, the non-cluster housing in, in our variance procedure. We talked about last night that a lot of people don't understand that there's, there is a, a due process within our fire codes where folks or residents or builders can request alternative measures from the fire chief. So, so when, you, when people go about building houses and, and, and if you're actually the builders, they should be aware of this tra as people in the trade, but as citizens as well who want to build a house, um, they know that they have to comply with code. And, and what, we've been, what we've said and discussed in the previous discussion was just that people should also be aware there's a variance situation. Not that, that these, are, these variances have to be um, really based on the facts of the matter. They have to show justification. There's a process you go through for variance that people should have notice of that. Could you describe the, the, the kind of variance notice that oh, they should be taken? Well, one of the things that we're looking at right now is how we better advertise the fact that people do have alternatives or can, can request alternatives to whatever provisions in the local fire code. If it's a local fire code issue and somebody, for example, somebody wants um, to, to not sprinkle a house, I guess that's the simplest example. Yeah. Um, I can give or a building, they can request a variance from the fire chief and, and in essence what they're saying is we will do this instead of sprinkling. Yeah. And it's so you're almost accepting something that's in an equal or as close to equal level of protection. So for example, um, uh, we had a, a, a one large structure that was built, it wasn't attached to a building. The property owner would have been very costly, more cost prohibitive to sprinkle the building uh -huh. than it was. It was not reasonable, and in in essence, what that gentleman did was ex is said, "I'll put a fire alarm system in that's monitored by an alarm company." In my mind, the that that the reasonableness of that request, what it rose to the level that yeah, yeah. it was reasonable, and we granted it. Yeah. 
Um, so there is the ability, and that, that works with any segment of the code that's adopted locally. So the code is, you know, we're here to try to enforce and implement the code using reasonable discretion. We're listening to people, you know, but we're also always in mind our public safety function that we're, we're making sure the safety is protected for the public, for the, the persons building it, and the people next door, the neighborhood. So, so we're trying to, we're, we're working in that balance, but trying to preserve our safety needs of the community. And, and interesting, for, I mean, just as a history lesson, and, and I learned this over the last few days, is that, that what promulgated the local fire code in the city of Lebanon was the Great Fire of 1964. So mm -hmm. it seems like every community has a great fire and then they beef up their fire protection or they beef up their local regulations yeah. to, to provide, you know, a manageable mm -hmm. level of protection. And, and, you know, truthfully, Greg, we have had small fires extinguished by fire sprinklers within the city that have caused very minimal damage and in one instance absolutely saved a life. We had a, a gentleman that had fallen asleep in a chair. Um, that sprinkler put that fire out and, and honestly saved his life. So, you know, it's not that we look at the national data and say, yeah, they save lives. We can anecdotally look at it from an internal perspective and say, yes, and it, see it something does on the work. Because so. I know the issue, and the public should be aware that, you know, the issue was brought up about uh, certain people feeling in there that, that, that the cost of the, of the sprinkler systems and new structures was, was too much. Um, and so what happens when that, the, there's always the, the question of enforcement and cost and benefits. Um, that's why I have a city council to kind of weigh and understand those things. On professional levels that we are, we try to make the best professional recommendations and the council makes sure they hear the citizens and then they have to work through and look at the balance. I think this uh, particular one on the, on the one and two uh, uh, dwellings was back in 2005 or something. Correct, it was an and accident. It was so, so that's how we do, how it does it. It's remarkable the democracy and the representative government going on in the local places. And if someone didn't, so you someone asked for a variance, uh, if they meet the proper procedures, but you found there wasn't sufficient grounds for the variance, do they have an appeal? They have, they have the ability to then appeal to the zoning board um, for um, a hearing. And yeah. and I've been through that process, and I have been overruled. And you know, it's that's a part of doing business. I'm, you know, it's uh, it's I'm happy to say that I'm definitely not always right, and that you know, having another set of eyes sometimes looking at something and, and making a decision is you know, so be it. But uh, you know, I'm, I, I guarantee you that people always get professionalism out of me and and, and the staff within the fire department. And uh, you know, I I'm I'm paid by the taxpayers of this community to provide my professional opinion and experience of you know 30 plus years to application of codes and and I don't always agree with my inspectors you know we, we will sit down if we have a controversial issue um, we, or there's a disagreement in the interpretation of a code ultimately under state law the buck stops with me and they don't always like what I have to say so mm -hmm. and you know and I'm not always gonna say well my way is the only way it's the, the reality is that we have to work together to uh, to do what's in my mind, what's important for safety, and secondly, what's important to the uh, to the person that's requesting, uh, you know, plan review or or, or code issue or, yeah. or whatever. So we work with people, mm -hmm. and, our, and that follows our commitment to engage people, to be professional, and to protect people's interests, but also protect the public's interests and safety. You know, some people I think would be interested in in you know, people often think the fire fire uh, fire occurs in your house. And then the, the fire department comes basically to your assistance. Could you describe how that process works a little bit? Yeah, it depends on one first how we receive the call. Um, mm -hmm. If uh, if a call goes to nine one one in the state of New Hampshire, um, the the call is routed to either Concord or Laconia. There are two nine one one centers in New Hampshire, and then fairly simultaneously with technology, it's transferred to the to the correct dispatch agency. In our case, it's our own Lebanon um, Public Safety Dispatch uh, is a division of the police department. Um, they then dispatch our, our initial crews. Um, um, it, we staff two stations, one in West Lebanon and, and uh, a central station uptown. Um, while that's going on, um, because some of the response standards and safety standards that we really need to follow require more people than we have on duty to a call. Mm -hmm. um, one of the beauties in Lebanon is that our mutual aid system is 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 fa is phenomenal, mm -hmm. and we have entered into mm -hmm. automatic mutual aid agreements with the town of Hartford and the so town we're helping each other in Hanover. So that, for example, when you have a single family building fire, typically you need about twelve people to 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 deal with that incident safely. Mm -hmm. um, in order to meet that staffing requirement, 
Hartford sends folks, Hanover, New Hampshire sends folks, and conversely, we do the same to them. Um, and that's how we're able to meet our minimum standards until we can recall our off-duty folks to, to staff other pieces of apparatus and, and, and meet the other mm -hmm. response demands of the community. It looks like there needs to be a lot of communication going on to, to, to bring the, to bear what's needed in terms of resource to meet the yeah, and, situation. And through our, you know, our mutual aid association, which is 40 some odd towns, we, we've really tied up a lot of the loose ends in how we communicate and, 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 you know, the relationship between the communities, we, we train together, we work together fairly often. So mm -hmm. the, the, our firefighters know each other, our fire officers know mm -hmm. each other. Um, I was at a fire in Hanover this past weekend. I was over at a fire in Vermont a couple weeks ago. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the three fire chiefs work f fantastically together. And, and you know, when um, Chief Bradley in Hanover is out of town, I mm -hmm. kind of keep an ear out and cover him. And when I'm out of town or Jeff's out of town, my assistant chief, he'll kind of come down and cover us. And, and the same thing with Chief Locke over here in, uh, in Hartford. So it's a, it's a system where everybody knows each other. And, yeah. and the, the, I, I hear people talk about regionalization mm -hmm. and we are a regional fire department. You know, yeah. the, the, the way we provide fire service to our, to our communities in, in, in the three main communities in the Upper Valley, um, we, are, we do it by regionalization and, you know, yeah. and sharing yeah. resources. Uh, another question is often asked me, um, I want to make sure we, we keep on our time, um, but is um, the question of uh, how do you become a firefighter? How's that happen? I mean, uh, I guess I watched Rescue Me for a while, but I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure that show. I don't know that that's the best example. <laughs> I don't know that's the best example. It's pretty dramatic. You know, it's, but. it's interesting. If, if anybody, first of all, is interested in becoming a firefighter, looking at it as a career path, uh, my door is always open uh, Monday through Friday days. Just come into the fire station if I can't see you. Um, either my assistant chief or, or my duty captain is happy to talk to people and we, we will mentor mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. folks to, to how to develop their career path. Yeah. Um, when I started the fire service uh, uh, an awful long time ago, um, it really wasn't as competitive as I think it is now. I think with the economy and, and people out of work, more people are applying. Um, yeah. Our last firefighter's vacancy, we had 65 applicants. But, wow. But so generally, one vacancy and there were 65 applicants? One vacancy applicants. with 65 applicants. And I think what we try to look for in a background is somebody that has mm -hmm. some training so that we're not, you know, training is very expensive. Yeah. Um, it's very time consuming, um, mm -hmm. both on the emergency medical side and the fire side. Mm -hmm. um, but to be a full-time firefighter in the state of New Hampshire, um, you have to be within one year of data hire, firefighter level two, um, which mm -hmm. is uh, about 250, 260 hours worth of training to get to that level. Mm -hmm. um, you have to have passed a candidate physical ability test. Um, is a mm -hmm. certified exam that the state of New Hampshire runs and several others do mm -hmm. the same exam. Mm -hmm. um, that you have to have before you can even start day one. Okay. Um, so what we try to tell people that come to see me, we had a, a young fellow that was just on our call force that uh, was just hired in Hanover mm -hmm. um, as a full-time firefighter, uh, came to me when he was in high school and said, I want to be a firefighter, what do yeah. I do? Mm -hmm. And we talked him into joining a volunteer fire department mm -hmm. and starting to go through some training. He went to the, the technical college up in uh, Laconia and uh, got his associate's degree in fire science, got his level two firefighter, got his EMT license, went on and got his EMT intermediate. The more certifications you have, the more marketable you are. And okay. you know, when you start matching candidates' qualifications, uh -huh. you know, certainly from a, from a cost benefit you know, analysis. It's it's better mm -hmm. for me to hire somebody that has all the prerequisite training than to hire somebody and put them through the fire academy. Yeah, so. yeah. Well, that really makes some makes some sense. So, bottom line, if you're a, you're a starter, just fr fresh, no experience, where do you go to get the experience? Join a volunteer fire department, okay. or and go to any your any all of our all of. Every community in the Upper Valley mm -hmm. has a volunteer or a call fire department. We, uh -huh. Our call firefighters are paid by the hour, yeah. so they're technically not volunteers, but yeah. their, their drive is not the $11 an hour we pay them. The drive is that they want to serve their they community. They want to serve the so community. So in my mind, they're volunteers. We mm -hmm. just happen to give them a little bit of money to, to make it um, a little yeah. bit more worth their while yeah. and, and, uh, and helping them out a little bit. So On the side of the house about on the EMT side, um, so I am out there in Lebanon, and I have a I, I have a sudden um, you know immediate uh, uh, health distress, and I need immediate uh, help, uh, and I'm unable to provide that myself. And 
what's what now, as we talk about fighting a fire at a, at a house now how would this is not now so now we're moving to the providing that service to that individual in distress so so what people need to do is dial 911 that's the that's the that's probably the single first most important step they can do um if obviously if they're in an area that's not safe mm -hmm. get out of that area yeah. but dial 911 when the 911 operator talks to them they're talking simultaneously with Lebanon dispatchers, and, and, and they're all very highly trained, very, very professional. And what that call taker at 911 in Concord or Laconia is doing is they're going to run through a bunch of questions, and you're probably going to feel annoyed, but there's a reason that they're doing that. And, and what they're fundamentally doing is they're trying to gauge mm -hmm. um, on a scale of one to five how serious your call is and, and what is really going on with are you having a heart attack or yeah. did you fall and twist your ankle? Mm -hmm. And when they go through those that list of, of, of questions, they're going to come up with what's called a call identifier or a call mm -hmm. coder. Um, alpha, beta, mm -hmm. excuse me, alpha, bravo, charlie, delta, mm -hmm. or echo. And when they when the call is dispatched to our EMTs or our, our, our stations, yeah. that call identifier tells us how many resources we need to send to the scene. So yes. if it's an alpha level call, for example, mm -hmm. it's typically a very minor call. Somebody fell and twisted their ankle or yeah. they've fallen out of bed and they can't get up kind of thing. Yeah. And what we end up doing is we send one ambulance with no lights and sirens because it's not an mm -hmm. urgent call. Yeah. Um, whereas a delta or an echo level call, delta level call is going to bring both ambulances and probably the duty officer mm -hmm. because we need more people. Those are the advanced life support. You're going to mm -hmm. use paramedic kind of level calls. Mm -hmm. If you have an echo level call, which are typically cardiac arrests, probably the most common, somebody yeah. that's not breathing and has no pulse, yeah. mm -hmm. um, that's not only going to bring the duty crew, but if during the day it's going to bring a fire inspector and possibly a okay. chief officer. So mm -hmm. that the information you give may not seem real important mm -hmm. while you're in distress, but it is important for us to determine what resources we send. So, mm -hmm. you know, if in doubt, we're going to send more yeah. and we can cancel them, but we don't want to send mm -hmm. little and then find out we need and Then them. you have to add because and the, the time you get there, you want them to be there and ready with resources. Correct. Even that, if you're a little over, that, you'd rather be a little over than under because then you have to bring more resources. And that, there's a, you know, that four to six minute window is kind of the critical criteria yeah. for us. Mm -hmm. So it's important. Yeah, that's, that's good. Um, are there? I know last year. I know we brought in the 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 flag, the huge flag, the fire department, the fire uh, the patriot flag. Patriot flag was brought in by the by the firefighters getting together and involving. I thought that was a, that was like a once in a lifetime event for me. I haven't haven't witnessed it. It was wonderful. Um, uh, in the horizon, the next year or two, or, or wherever, is there is there is there things that are going on that we maybe should get alert to? Uh, well, in terms of what's happening, uh, I think uh, certainly the, the you know the, the two big events that happen every single year in the city for the for the fire department are the uh, the firefighters union started a firefighter safety day around September every year oh, at the nice, Lebanon High nice, School. Nice. Um, we do some demonstrations. Uh, we allow people to actually use fire extinguishers. They do sprinkler demonstrations. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's nice. fire trucks for people to sit on and yeah. all kinds of giveaways. Um, I mean that's a big event and and we really you know it keeps getting bigger every year. Uh -huh. um, and our annual Halloween open house. Um, uh, it's yeah, a, that's the open house on Halloween. It's, that's a, it's so amazing cool. to see, th you know, three, four thousand people come through there on, on, <laughs> in a in a three hour window on Halloween <laughs> night. To, uh, and you know, the the, the yeah. interesting thing is, there's so many things donated, it, and it gives our firefighters yeah. an opportunity to interact with the public yeah. in a non emergency scenario. Yeah, and it gives them. Um, you know, yeah. it's a it's a great, great, great public relations tool and, and community event. So, you know, last couple of minutes here, um, tips for fire prevention in your in your household, or, or just tips from a firefighter perspective and an EMT's perspective on a household. And if there's any top top four tips or top five tips or top ten tips or three tips. Well, we do publish a top 10 list, which is on our website, oh, which sorry. is interesting. It's mm -hmm. on the web page for the fire department. But interesting enough, I say um, what, what still troubles me after 30 years in the fire service is the number of times we have a fire, whether it be small or large, where we find non-working smoke detectors. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I think it's if, if you have one device in your home um, as a fire safety device, it's probably the single most important device. Single most important. So, you know, have smoke detectors in, on all levels mm -hmm. of your house. Mm -hmm. um, change your batteries twice a year. Change your clock, change your batteries, a theme that we've... Yeah, uh, that's a, we've, you know, try to catch your mirror that change that time, change those batteries. Correct. So, in all levels of you your know, house. Make sure that you have fresh batteries in your smoke detector. 
Um, if you have problems with a smoke detector, you're not sure if it's working correctly, call us. You know, we're, we're happy to come out and we'd rather work with people to make sure that things are working properly and, and yeah. spend a little time proactively. Yeah. Um, it, you know, at times we find that people don't have a smoke detector. We have free giveaways at mm -hmm, times. Mm -hmm, um, we have given mm -hmm. carbon monoxide detectors is another biggie yeah. um, as you, you get into fossil fuels. Um, you know, having a fire extinguisher in your home and, and, and knowing how to use it uh, fire escape plan for your yes. family mm -hmm. again you know the, the things that we yeah. we learn you know in elementary school that, yeah. that really stick with us uh, the fire know, drills later on so those I think would be the top four in my mind well that that's really good well I want to appreciate you taking the time today to be here with us and uh, um, I think you know firefighters have always been our friends and um, and you know they're, they're oftentimes more than friends are our rescuers and uh, and uh, when they come as EMTs or they come as firefighters, it's uh, it's great to have uh, uh, such a fine crew in our community. And um, we look forward to having a good year. And Chief, I'm going to ask, perhaps you can pick a few of your, your fighters out uh, and a few of your specialists. And we'll come in and spend a 15 minutes with me talking about some aspect of the, of the service that they're in. Absolutely. I know our guys will be happy to do that. We've got a great, great, great department. I'm very All proud right. of them. All right. Let's have a good 2012. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks a lot, Chris. Great. Great to see you.